when we encounter the living God, we can't help but worship. When we see the face of Christ, we can't help but worship. And that's why it says that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. This isn't something we can produce. Oh man, we can, we can put an order of service together. We do it every week. There it is. And it says silly things in there like, don't forget to announce these things, and I'm going to pray at this point. And sometimes these are good ways of keeping us all on the same time, but other times we need to set it down and listen to the voice of God. And that's where I find myself today. I, I have my notes. I have the sermon. Yet something needs to stir our hearts in a new way because we hear teaching, we hear preaching, we sing, whether it's in church or on the radio with, uh, with uh, the vocalists that we hear. We do all of this, and I fear sometimes we're going through the motions but never encountering God. We try to create our definitions and our doctrines and our dogmas and make no mistake. <laughs> I'm a theologian. Like, it's become an actual title for me. Apparently, I did not know this until just this week, apparently working on a doctorate means you're a professional. Oh, I didn't know that. It placed a burden upon me that I haven't borne before, which means, I guess, not that my words didn't mean something before, but it means that I should watch my words more carefully, I suppose. So allow me to ignore that advice and be less cautious this morning. In fact, I've been less cautious these last few weeks. You do know end times stuff is always going to get someone in trouble. <laughs> I, I mean, when I was looking at this series and we were trying to figure out how to map this out, each week as I was scribbling out ideas and we were coming to the passages, I thought, oh, this is going to get me fired. <laughs> and so here we are. We're four weeks in, one more week. Next week we'll be dealing with the church and mission. Like this should all mean something. It's not just a novelty. It's not just an accident alongside the road that we can't stop, that we can't help but rubberneck and watch. We treat end time stuff sometimes like that, like the cataclysm we don't want to watch but we can't help but look at. And I think there's a better way of handling it. I've said the last couple of weeks, I hope you brought two things with you. First of all, your brains and your Bibles, because it's going to require both. Um, if you didn't bring a Bible with you, um, you can get one on your phone. You can Google these passages. I love it. Like, there's times I've become lazy, I admit. There's times um, I, I can't remember where I left my Bible because... I use my phone as much as I use my Bible anymore, and I probably shouldn't admit that, but it's great to have these tools accessible. So if you've got any of those tools accessible this morning, 1 Thessalonians, you heard the passage, 1 Thessalonians 4, I'm also going to put some of the words up on the screen as we move through the service today. Um, hopefully it keeps us all on the same page, but today... I, I told you this series was going to be a mixture of preaching and teaching. Some days it was going to be heavier on teaching, other days more on preaching. Next Sunday I'm excited about is pure preaching, and I love that. Today is a lot of teaching, and I love that too. Um, and so this morning we're going to walk through some of this passage. But do you know this passage has been used to do a lot of damage in the church. A lot of damage. I usually don't carry my cell phone with me up on the platform because you will all start texting me. And I know that. Um, some of you do it, and, and I see it on my tablet anyway, 
um, but I ignore it. Um, here's what I happened a, a while ago is I dismissed a, a text that came in as I was preaching, and somehow I, I didn't just silence them, I blocked them. <laughs> and they didn't find out till a couple of weeks later. They're like, did I make you mad? No, I enjoy ignoring you. Um, but, uh, but here, I, I, I want to read, you know, this is, this is how you research stuff. You go to Wikipedia. That's research. I'm kidding. You were like, you thought I was serious. Don't read. This is not research. But let me read from a Wikipedia page today. Um, and I, I donated my $3, so I'm able to do this this morning. Um, but anybody familiar with the name Harold Camping? Does that name sound familiar from about 2011? Okay, good. Wow. You're going to recognize it as soon as I start talking about it. Harold Camping had made a series of predictions about the return of Christ. And in 2011, he said, May 21st, 2011, um, something cataclysmic is going to happen. What happened was... He garnered a whole bunch of support and he raised over a hundred million dollars to advertise the return of Christ. Now, there's problems with that sentence all the way through. First of all, Jesus doesn't need our help to advertise, right? First of all. Second of all, there's actual Bible verses about not doing that. Third of all, a hundred million people cashed in on retirement accounts. They gave away their life savings. And May 21st came and went. And now it's 2022. Harold Camping is dead and retirement accounts are drained. But here's what it says of Harold Camping. His prediction for May 21st, 2011 was widely reported in part because of a large-scale publicity campaign by Family Radio out of California. Um, maybe I'll get on and redact this article. Um, uh, and, and it prompted ridicule from atheist organizations and rebuttals from Christian organizations. Ah, there are some Christians in the world. Um, after May 21st passed without the predicted events, Camping, Camping said... Um, that he believed that a spiritual judgment had occurred on that date and the, that the physical rapture would occur instead on October 21st. Like, just kidding, <laughs> just kidding. Um, that the physical rapture would occur on October 21st, 2011, simultaneously with the final destruction of the universe by God. Did you get that? Here's why I wanted to read this, because this doctrine... I'm, giving my, I'm laying my all on the altar. Um, this, uh, this doctrine of rapture has been used to do bad things in the church. Bad things. And bad things in the world in terms of credibility. It's done bad things things for us. This is one example out of many. I can read historical accounts of people climbing trees in uh, ascension robes who believe that, that Jesus was carrying them up into heaven, so they climbed the tree just to start further off the ground than other people, like it's a race. Um, I'm hearing uh, Mr. Bean from, uh, from Rat Race. It's a race, it's a race, right? And, and, and so they, 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 felt themselves, they felt themselves rising and, uh, and, and it, they really weren't because they let go of the branch. They were rising, they're rising. No, gravity was there and many of them fell and died. Crazy stuff. People died of exposure on mountaintops because they wanted to get that much closer. Like uh, there's story after story of this, and not to mention the sensationalism that has been built around this. Um, a book series based on dispensational thinking, and it's a good, it's a good uh, fiction, left behind series. I've read them, enjoyed it. But there's problems with these concepts of rapture. And we've done bad things with them today. And so today, I want to kind of talk uh, some about this in terms of a theological framework. And I want to get back to what the Bible actually says. Isn't that a good thing to do? 
What does the Bible actually say? Not what does Harold Camping say and not what does the skinny Nazarene preacher say. What does the Bible actually say? And so we need to get back into this passage. It's why we read it. That's why we've sung about it. Um, because there is something here for us, I believe. This isn't just about an apocalypse. There is actually a promise in the midst of it. Um, so here is how typical rapture, dispensational teaching goes. Some of this will be a caricature. I will be overstating things in a way uh, to highlight some what I term egregious errors. Okay, so here is the typical, and you heard it in the Herald Camping article where the rapture and the destruction of the world by God go together. Okay, so here's typically how this happens, how it's taught. Is that some future date, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, maybe uh, down the road, May 21st, 2023. I don't know. Harold Camping knows, apparently. No, he doesn't. But uh, at some future date, all of a sudden, people are going to disappear. Uh, theologians call it the secret rapture. Right? Um, people are going to disappear. If you've seen the movies, you know we're not going to be wearing clothes because it all gets left behind. What gets left behind are piles of clothes and apparently dental fillings. I, I have determined, um, I, I have a great interpretation of Revelation when it talks about casting our crowns before the throne of Jesus. I'm not going to have any teeth. Like, like I, I know in heaven I'm going to have no teeth because I've got a lot of crowns. Um, so heart problems do that for you. So I'm going to cast my crowns before the Lord. I don't know. Um, but uh, but we, uh, right, we teach, we've taught this that we're going to, Fly up, and, and here's what's going to happen. Christ is going to return. Let's put that in air quotes, can we? Christ is going to return in a second advent, a second return, but he's going to come part way down, meet us in the air. He's going to snatch out those of us that have prayed a magic prayer, those of us that have made a profession of faith, and we're going to leave our clothes behind. We're going to meet him in the air. Then we're going to turn around, make a return journey to heaven, and the earth can burn. Caricature. I know, I'm overstating my case, but I'm pretty close, aren't I? Kind of how that teaching goes, planes are going to crash. I remember when I, was, when I first came to faith as a 20-ish year old, I was raised in the church, so there were things I just knew, but I didn't know why I knew what I knew, <laughs> right? I hadn't really explored that, and, and I, I, I instantly grabbed on to this idea of rapture. I was very excited about my newfound faith, and so I went to the store, the Christian bookstore, to buy a book. I remember the book, uh, Tony Evans, Loose That Man. Uh, I remember the book, and as I was checking out 26 years ago, um, holy cow, Dana's getting old. Um, <laughs> as I was checking out, um, there was a whole rack of bumper stickers, Christian bumper stickers. Oh, I needed a Christian bumper sticker. I don't do it now because I'm a horrible driver and I don't want to be a bad witness. Um, but uh, uh, but I, I, I needed a Christian bumper sticker and so I, I went through all of them and I found the one that I knew I needed. Warning, in case of rapture, this car will be unmanned. Right? Have you seen that bumper sticker or something like it? That was me. That fly hoopty I was in, that 19, 1993 Geo Metro three-cylinder, it was awesome. Um, I was awesome. There I was driving around, warning in case of rapture, this, uh, this car will be unmanned. In case of rapture, this plane will be unmanned. Don't listen to this, Zico. Um, uh, <laughs> our pilot in the room, right? No. Hey, like, like, no. Um, then we end up with a castaway situation. It's, it, it would go bad. But uh, uh, we, we've talked about this. We've seen the movies, Nicolas Cage, uh, Kirk Cameron, all of this. Good fictions. Let me be clear on this. It's not what the Bible says. Now you're like, well, you don't believe in the rapture, Pastor? I do. I absolutely do because it's in this passage. But let's walk through the passage and find out what the Bible actually says. So bear with me this morning. Here, here we go. Here's the first part of it. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters. It's implied. About those who are asleep, euphemism, dead, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. We have hope. Amen? 
We have hope. Um, and we grieve. We go to funerals. We grieve. It's real. I see some of you that even in the past year have buried spouses. We grieve. Grief, it, this isn't to say we don't grieve. We grieve. In fact, we grieve deeply. But in the thick of that grief, there is an unending hope. And the world doesn't understand this. So we don't grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. You see what's happening. We already get clues. Paul was writing to a church that was grieving. You see, here's where we start to get things wrong, is we take sometimes these passages and we read them in view of the 20th or 21st century without recognizing that they were first century documents written to a first century church with first century mentalities. We've got to do the hard work of understanding how it was understood then before we can apply it to, how, to our lives now. That's essential. And what was going on in the church, this is the early church. This is very early in the church. This is perhaps one of Paul's first letters that we have a copy of. This is early. It's earlier before Romans. It's earlier than the Corinthian discourse. This is early. And so he's writing this, and what was happening in the church at the time was persecution was breaking out against the church, the early church. And, uh, and emperors, uh, some very famous ones, I, you, we know the name Nero, very infamous in that, um, putting Christians in Colosseums, dipping them in fire, light, in, in oil, lighting them on fire to light his dinner parties, right? And just horrible things were happening. And, and that first church had heard the message of Jesus and understood it to be saying that, that he would return before they died. And you read some of the passages and you get why they believed that. But they had this understanding. So all of a sudden, these early Christians start dying, whether by persecution or by natural causes. They were dying. And, and, and people were, like, were saying, time out. I thought he was coming back before these people died. All of this stuff you've been talking about, about Christ's return, they're going to miss out on it. And Paul is saying, no, actually, they have a front row seat. Here's what I want to say to those of you who have lost someone near and dear. They miss nothing. They miss nothing. They are part of it from beginning to end. Nothing is missed. In fact, this passage begins to tease at the fact that they have a privileged even position within this. So this is the context of what Paul was writing. Here's what he goes on to say. He says, For this we declare to you from, uh, by a word from the Lord that we who, boy, who typed that up, uh, we who are alive, who are left until the coming. You want to learn, learn Greek? Parousia. It's a good word. It's coming. The parousia of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry, wowza, um, a cry of command with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Did you know the reason we lay our deceased in a cemetery the way that we do is because of this passage. Most cemeteries, not as much anymore, but most cemeteries are set up on an east to west axis because tradition says Christ will return in the east or from the east. And so we lay them, and next time you're at a cemetery, you'll notice this is the case. We lay them in the ground, head to the west, feet to the east, so that when they rise, they're facing the east the return of Christ. We're giving them a privileged spot. Um, the way we care for our dead is a theological movement itself. And it doesn't matter if they're in a six-foot box or in an urn. God can work with it. Um, and, and so th this comes right from that passage. But notice this word coming, parousia. What a neat word. It translates as coming, but... Coming for us in the English language could mean, well, I'm coming home for dinner. 
I'm, I'm coming to church. Well, that was a bad sentence, but that, that I need to tear apart the theology on that. I'll do that at a different time. Um, I, I, right, I'm, I, I'm coming to Walmart. Well, this isn't the sermon on hell. Um, I, I'm, <laughs> right, uh, wh- whatever it is, uh, coming can mean almost anything. But the Greek word parousia means one thing. One thing. It means royal coming. Royal appearance. Here's what happened in the first century world. Um, There was no internet. Aren't you glad you don't live then? There's no internet. There was no cell phones. There were no airplanes. There weren't itineraries. Um, There was no way of communicating the way that we understand communication. So how do you maintain a vast sprawling empire like Rome? Well, what you need is for the emperor to go to these different places, city-states and regions. And, and so what he would do, sometimes after a battle or, or, or sometimes just as a PR campaign during an election year, they, did, they didn't elect emperors, um, but whatever. Um, uh, sometimes he would just make this circuit, as it were. But what he would do is he would send messengers ahead. They would say, okay, so watch for these signs. When you see this standard, this royal crest coming up over the hill, you know, I'm picturing Monty Python with the coconut shells, you know. But when you see this, uh, this crest, this standard coming up over the hill, um, uh, be prepared. You've got to be watching for it. In the meantime, you've got to be ready because the king is coming. Get get ready, get the town ready, get your homes ready. We want everything in order for when the king comes, but we're going to set people on the watchtower. Shout out to Bob Dylan and Jimi Hendrix. Um, We're going to set people on the watchtower. Great song. And and they're going to look. They're going to look off into the horizon, and they're going to watch for the standards. And when those standards, when those flags come up over the hill, um, they're going to hear maybe a trumpet declaring what's happening. And they're going to go, the king is coming. The king, the king is coming. And if you weren't ready, you're going to miss something. So here's what would happen is when the king would come, the shout would go out in the city. And, and the cries would go. And the people that weren't prepared would begin to panic. The ones that were prepared, here's what they would do. They'd get excited, and they would go out to meet him. Ah, this is going to show up in the next set of verses. They would go out to meet him. In fact, let's look at it this morning. Here's the last set. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up. Harpazo, Greek, in the Latin, raptura. Where do we get our word rapture? This single place in scripture. This is the only time the word appears in the whole Bible. And it's Latin. You you were speaking Latin and didn't even know it. Um, Harpazo, um, you will be caught up Uh, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with with this word. So here's what's happening. Uh, When when, uh, the king's uh, arrival would be announced, they would look for the signs. They would hear the trumpets. They would know he's finally coming. They would get caught up in the moment. They They would drop what they were doing, and they would go out, go up to meet the king in the king's arrival. Now, what the king didn't do at that point was take the people that met him on the road and say, okay, let's go back to Rome. That's not what he did. The king was coming into the city to bring justice, to bring righteousness, uh, to, uh, to remove the wrongs and make them right. The king is here, which means things had better be shaped up. And they go out to meet him. And there was this kind of parade that would occur, an entourage. And they would come in with the king. Church, we've misread this passage for about 180 years. It does not mean we fly off to heaven. And here's why this has proven so much damage in the church. Because we have believed that our flight from this earth to heaven means we bear no earthly responsibility except to mark time until Jesus comes so that we can get out of here. The rest of it can burn. 
people. We're going to tell you, but really it's, it, we're telling you because we got like, we call it good news. It's good news for us. It's bad news for you. And we do a little Willy Wonka dance, um, even though we, we never really say that. And, 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 and we're going to fly off and the world can literally go to hell. No responsibility here. That's what we've done with this passage. It is not what this passage says. In fact, it says the exact opposite. It says when we are caught up in the air and we meet Christ in the air, we become part of the royal parade. In other words, we bear responsibility right here and now. Uh, we, bear, uh, we bear partnership in the return of Christ right here and now and someday when Christ returns in his full glory. Uh, this is what the passage meant. Every first century Christian that read it understood this. What did we get wrong? Well, back in the early 1800s, there was a man by the name of John, uh, John Darby. 1839, maybe 1829, I can't remember exactly, uh, but he, he posited, he put forth this theological construct, and he forgot to understand what the first century construct was, and instead he applied it to his life, and he saw that word rapture, and in, in his mind he says, we're out of here, we're gone, I'm gone, I don't have to deal with this anymore. And he taught this, and it became something of a popular teaching, kind of, in England, his native England. Um, and eventually, he made a trip to the United States. And uh, he, through uh, another teacher, he encountered a man by the name of Cyrus Schofield. Name sound familiar? Anybody heard of the Schofield Reference Bible? Yes. In 1939, no, excuse me, 1909, the Schofield Reference Bible, a great Bible, really. It really is. But he, he had referenced things and he put notes. It was kind of like the first study Bible. I like life application if you use stuff like that, right? But it was kind of like the first study Bible. It's still on the market. But in there, he, uh, he had listened to this theology from Darby and Cyrus Schofield put it into his notes for this passage in 1909 and it somehow became entrenched in evangelical Christianity. Can I say this doctrine of flying away to heaven is younger than our nation? Prior to 1909, prior to 1839, this was never taught, ever. And whenever we see something like this emerge on the scene out of seemingly thin air, we need to ask questions. But we adopted, I adopted it, I thought this meant being, I thought understanding it that way meant being a Christian, that I couldn't be a Christian if I didn't mean it this way, if, if I didn't mean it this way. And so I remember when I was first confronted with this, when I started learning languages and, and, and studying these passages, I remember when I was first encountered with it, and, and you know what it felt like inside? It felt like I was losing my faith because it was so bound up in there. You know what it feels like now? It feels like I'm finding my faith. Because there is a greater truth in here for us, and here is the truth, that rapture for us, and, and understand this this morning, I'm not saying I don't believe in rapture. You understand this? I do. It's in the Bible. I believe it. I believe I'm going to meet Christ in the air, but I don't think he's going to turn around and take me to some far-off heavenly scape. I get to be part of a parade. I get to be part of the restoration work of Christ. I don't like to mirror passages too often because it loses context, but in, allow me this indulgence this morning. There is a passage in Revelation 20, and it talks about Christ returning on a white horse. You familiar with it? Sword comes out of his mouth. His eyes are blazing. You understand, so much of this is metaphor. When we see Christ, he's not going to be like, uh, what's the dude's name from X-Men, right? He's not gonna, it's not like that. It's not like that. Um, so a lot of this is metaphor, but he's got the blazing eyes, the word of the Lord. It's, it's the word that's cutting down, not the violence of 
waging war. It's the word of God that cuts down. The sword's coming out of his mouth. His robe is, dre is drenched in blood. It's sacrificial blood, his blood. He's pre-bloodied for the war. Um, and there's a name written on his thigh. I think it's a monster tattoo. It says, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In other words, not Caesar, not Nero, not presidents, not prime ministers, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he appears, and it says that he is surrounded by the armies of the heavens. I think this is his parousia, his royal coming. And the armies that Revelation talks about, I don't know. I think I get to be a part of. I think that's me I'm reading about in that passage. Of course, there's the rider on the white horse. I know distinctly that that is not me, but I think I'm in that passage, and I think you're in that passage. And, and so what does this have to do with us today, right now? Obviously, we need a corrective, I think. We need a corrective. We need to stop treating our life as if heaven is, a, is an escape from it. We bear responsibility for it right now. We bear responsibility. We bear the justice of God in this world right now. Uh, we, are king, we, are, we are ambassadors of that king, and we are to act heavenly even on earth this is the prayer that i keep coming back to that jesus taught us to pray thy kingdom come on earth on earth we don't fly away that is exactly contrary to what scripture says read the bible uh, every point it's not us moving towards god every point it's god moving towards us and one of my favorite passages in all of scripture comes right at the end revelation chapter 21 uh, john says then i saw then i saw the new heavens and the new earth notice it's not a burned up earth it's not an earth that is consumed and, and destroyed. It's an, it's, it's an earth and a new heavens that is purified by the fire, the holy fire of God, and now it's new. The earth is new, the heavens are new, the, the cosmos is new. Then I saw a new heavens and a new earth and a new Jerusalem, beautifully adorned like a bride prepared for her husband, descending out of the heavens, and it came and it rested. Remember this passage? And God said, John the Revelator speaks, and he says, and, and, and I heard the voice of God. Now the dwelling of God is with man, with humanity. Notice it doesn't say, now the dwelling of humanity is with God. God's dwelling is with us. This is the movement of Scripture. It's God always coming to us. And so what we need to recognize right off the bat is that there is always a gracious movement on God's part moving towards us. And if we are to be missional in the church, if we are to apply this message appropriately in the church, then the church must also bear that same missional impetus. It's, it, we've got to quit waiting for the people to come to the church. <laughs> The church needs to go to the people because it's not like God's in his heaven unseen from us waiting for us to come to him. He's coming to us. Oh, and by his grace, he allows us the choice to say yes or no. That's love, but he's always coming to where we are. This is the mission of the church, and we've got to reclaim this. That's the first part of this. Here's the second part is the, the message of Christ needs to become a message of earth. I love it last week, Shelley changed a lyric for us. Remember we were singing the Gaither song, uh, there's just something about that name. That last line says, kings and kingdoms may all pass away, but there's something about that line, and Shelley's like, no, she'd have none of it. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. You understand, church, we belong to a different kingdom. We belong to a heavenly kingdom. And, and because we are citizens of heaven doesn't mean we should wait to act heavenly until we get to heaven. <laughs> it actually means the exact opposite. We bring heaven to earth in the behavior. So, so here we are. How does this corrective bear application in our life? First of all, it gives us responsibility. We can no longer claim that a rapture removes me from the responsibility of the message of God. 
first of all. Second of all, it tells us that we have a profound hope, and that hope is that we get to be a part of it through and through and through. And it tells us one final thing. It tells us that in God's movement towards us, we will see all that does not belong of God pass away and all things be made new. Here's what I've noticed in the world that I inhabit is we have lost hope. We've lost hope. The world is hopeless. Marriages are hopeless. Health situations are hopeless. We're hopeless. Even in the church, we have congregated as Eeyores. <laughs> Always walking around with a cloud over our head, waiting until God just zips us out of here. No, we live in the hope of the kingdom of God come on earth as it is in heaven. Christ is that hope, and we bear that hope now in us, now and for eternity. And so we've been given this message, we've been given this hope, we've been given this corrective, so now the question is, is what to do with it? I think it begins in what do we do when we dismiss today? How will you bear this message of hope? This is a gathering, it's once a week, it's worship, it's good, it's fun. This is not the church. This is a building. It's a, it's a building. This is not the church. The church is here in the pews, but the church is not the church if the pews are where they stay. Then you're just a church gnome. Remember garden gnomes? You're just a church gnome. If the pews become the place where you land, you're just a church gnome. God has not called us to be church gnomes. God has called us to be ambassadors for the kingdom of God. 